Um, this morning, you know, we finished the book of Hebrews, and I think what would be just kind of a nice, it's kind of a nice, easy lesson. We're not getting into, any, into anything too deep, but it's kind of humbling at the same time. We're just going to go through the, the Bible Bowl qu- questions. So for our kids, they had to learn all the questions for Hebrews. They were quizzed on Hebrews and James. And our kids did phenomenal. Abigail Ward, I think, only missed one question. And I think that's awesome. So I have the questions up here, and we're just going to kind of go through it. You know, when, and whenever I was working in Illinois, one of, the, one of the best things that they had going on, and a big event is called the, uh, I think it was just called the, uh, what they call it? Laurel, do you remember what they called it in Illinois when they got together for their own kind of Bible, bowl, Bible quiz? Trivia, Bible trivia. I think it was Bible trivia. So you got together, and it was it was all no all the Bible, right? And there were questions from everything, and it was a very humbling experience for everyone involved. And you you you'd come and you'd say, okay, uh, how old was Enoch before he died, right? <laughs> or before he was picked, taken up? That's that's a hard question to ask. And then there were easier questions, of course. Like, what city was Jesus born in? But it was so humbling. And so this morning, these quizzes are going to be very humbling. It's going to be nice and easy. You're just, I'm just going to, we're going to look at the question, and we'll have the answer immediately afterwards. So whenever uh, we actually had LTC for the Bible Bowl, I took the quiz that day, and I got an 88. Didn't do so great. I took the quiz yesterday again, and I am proud to say I only missed two. I only missed two. So we'll see how we do this morning. I'm not asking you to keep track of how you do. It's just a nice review. And then at the end, I also want to mention, I have a video that I want us to watch. It's from the Bible Project, which I think is an amazing uh, organization, where they try to illustrate uh, Bible principles and books of the Bible. And it just kind of does a really nice overview of the book of Hebrews, and I think that'll be a nice little bit of a review, and we'll do that towards the end. So when we're looking at, uh, and these are questions straight from the Bible, Uh, let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Lord Almighty, we thank you, God, for the chance to review the book of Hebrews and to challenge ourselves and how much we have learned from the book of Hebrews. And of course, it's a nice reminder to remember that we always need to be in your word, we always need to be studying, and that... We're never getting, to, we've never, we have not gotten to the point where we know everything. And of course, we won't get to that point, but you know everything. And so help us to learn more about you. Help us to learn more about our relationship with you. Help us to learn more about your son. And thank you, God, for just the chance to be here and to celebrate mothers and to be with our brothers and sisters and to love you and to worship you. We love you, Lord, and in your son's holy name, amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so. Round one. We won't get to the book of James. I'm going to save that for next week. We're going to start the book of James. I'm going to introduce it, and I'm going to take two classes a chapter, so we're going to have plenty of time to generate some discussion. That'll be ten weeks out of five chapters, and then we'll go ahead and do the Bible Bowl questions for James, too. So, verse one of Hebrews one. In the past, who did God speak to at many times and in various ways? Did he speak to the prophets through angels? Our ancestors through angels, our ancestors through the prophets, only Moses. So right away, challenging our, 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 our trivia knowledge, the answer is C. God spoke through, uh, to our forefathers through the prophets in various ways and in various times. Number two, which of the following <clears throat> is not something Hebrews chapter 1 says about God's son? Now, I tell you, whenever I am taking tests, that not throws me off all the time. Whenever I'm, I mean, I would, I would just, I, I would feel like I know the question and I'd read the first answer, I would circle it and I'd just move on. But God, he says a lot about God's son. What does he not say? The sun is the bright morning star. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. The sun is the exact representation of God's being. The sun sustains all things by the power of his word. The one that is not mentioned is A. The sun is the bright morning star. That is not mentioned in verse 3 of chapter 1. According to Hebrews 1, what did God's son do after he provided purification for sins? Verse 3, the son visited the spirits in prison. The son sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. The son crushed the head of the serpent. The son judged the nations. 
The answer in chapter 1, verse 3 is, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So far, how are we doing? We get all those right? It, it can be challenging. I mean, this is humbling. This is a nice reminder to think, okay, even though I just finished the book of Hebrews, I still need to study Hebrews. Number four, what did God say about the angels when he brings his firstborn into the world, right? Whenever comparing angels to Jesus, what did God say about Jesus? He said, verse number A, there is the new king in Bethlehem. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Let all God's angels worship him. Let, lift up your voices and praise the king of kings. Now, one of the things I've uh, that's been very challenging for me for these questions is, Sometimes there's an answer that might technically be right, but is not right when it concerns the verse we're talking about. Right. right. So at one point, God did say, this is my beloved son, listen to him. But that's not what he said in chapter 1, verse 6. So it's, it's kind of challenging. It's, like, it's not just what's correct. It's what does that verse say? And that makes it 10 times harder. God said, let all the angels worship him. Because we're comparing the angels to the son. The son, the son is greater than the angels. Number five, what kind of scepter did God say would be the scepter of the son's kingdom? Scepter of justice, authority, fire, and bronze. You probably eliminate bronze and fire. And the answer really is justice. And some translations say righteousness. Number six, which of the following was not said about the foundations of the earth and the heavens? So we're talking about how to, when, when God is talking about the earth and the heavens, he said, which one did he not say? The foundations of the earth and heavens were laid by the Lord, wear out like a garment, will remain, will be rolled up like a robe. This one, uh, the process of elimination really works in here. It's C. The heavens and earth will not remain. He's going to roll them up and he's going to put them aside. Number seven, who are all the angels sent to serve? Last verse of chapter one. Ministering, they are ministering spirits sent to serve all mankind, serve the Son, serve those who inherit salvation, serve one another. The answer is C. Serve those who inherit salvation. That is Christians. That is God's children. That is us. Getting into chapter 2, the author of Hebrew reminds us to pay careful attention to what we've heard so that we do not what? And he uses a unique phrase here. Become lost, become filled with confusion, lead others astray and drift away? The answer is drift away. You do not want to drift. I remember, we talked a little bit about that. Why does he say, he doesn't say just leave your faith. He says drift away as if this is a slow, gradual process, which really is usually how it happens, right? Yes. Number nine, which of the following was not mentioned as one of the ways that God testified to the salvation that was confirmed by those who heard him? So which of the ways did God not use to testify to the message? Again, this one is asking the question, in the verses, chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, which one is he not mentioning? Prophets, signs, gifts of the Holy Spirit, various miracles. And one of these is unlike the others. It's A, prophets. Now, God does use prophets, but not in that verse, right? Number 10, which of the following is not stated about Jesus in Hebrews 2, 9? This one, he suffered death. He was crowned with glory and honor. He tasted death for everyone. He was baptized. One of these is not like the other, right? He was baptized. The verse does not speak about that. He was baptized, but not in that verse, right? Jesus became flesh and blood, sharing in our humanity in order to do what? According to Hebrews 2.14. This one was hard for me. Bring many sons to glory. Appear to many witnesses. Break the devil's power of death. Be touched and believed in by those around him. The answer is, break the devil's power of death. He be, Jesus became flesh and blood. He became human to defeat Satan and the power of death. Number 12, in order for Jesus to be a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, making atonement for the sins of the people, he had to first do which of the following. In order for Jesus to be the person he is, the savior of the world, and to forgive all of our sins, what did he have to do first? Die as a criminal, rise from the dead, be betrayed and beaten, be born fully human, made like his brothers in every way. And that first refers to D. I mean, you can kind of remember Hebrews chapter 2 really focuses on Jesus becoming human, right? Really, I mean, like the last question was, he 
took on flesh and blood to defeat the power of Satan. Here, he took on flesh and blood. Why? So he could be a faithful priest and offer atonement. Chapter 3, verse 13, or number 13, not verse. What does Hebrews tell the holy brothers and sisters who share on a heavenly calling to fix their thoughts on? The things above, Jesus, our apostle and high priest, Moses, their ancestor, God, and his creation. Now, in Colossians chapter 3, he does, Paul does tell us, think about things above, but not here. Hebrews 3, we're talking about looking at Jesus. The answer is B. Why was the Lord angry with that generation of ancestors and declared an oath, they shall never enter my rest? Their hearts were always going astray. They hardened their hearts in rebellion. They had not known the ways of the Lord or D, all of these. And so remember in chapter 3 and chapter 4, what we're talking about is the nation of Israel. And we're making this parallel with the nation of Israel. Whenever they got to Canaan and, and God said, all right, you're about to enter the promised land, but you got to defeat these armies. And the nation of Israel said, those armies are too tough. We can't do it, right? And God said, well, you think you can't do it? Then you're not going to get into the rest. And so that whole gener he let the whole generation die out before he led the nation of Israel into the promised land. There's the parallel for us. Here's heaven. You ready to do it? In order to enter it, there's some difficulty you might have to face, like being persecuted, suffering in life. But if you go through that persecution and that suffering, you're going to get the promised land. But if you decide that it's too tough, guess what? You don't get to enter the promised land. And that's the point he's trying to make. And so what we're talking about, the, the nation of Israel, when they weren't going to enter the promised land because they were being stubborn and, unfaith, or, and not having faith in God, what were they? they? Their hearts were going astray. They hardened their hearts in the rebellion. And they didn't know the ways of the Lord. All of those are true. Number 15, how long or often should we encourage one another so that none of us has a sinful, hardened, unbelieving heart that turns away from the Lord? Chapter 3 really likes to hit on the idea that it's daily, so long as it's called today. Not weekly, not once a month, not annually, but daily. Number 16, which of the following was not true about those Moses led out of Egypt, right? So the group that Moses led out of Egypt, what is not true about these? According to Hebrews 3, 16 and 19, the Lord was angry with them for 40 years. That was true. The bodies of those who sinned against the Lord perished in the wilderness. That was true. The Amorites and Canaanites destroyed them. Is that true? Indeed, God swore to them they would never enter his rest because of their unbelief. That nation of Israel, that, that generation that was going to enter the promised land but didn't, God let them wander around in the desert because, if, but until they passed away because he wasn't going to let them enter the rest. So C is not true. Since the promise of entering God's rest still stands, we need to be careful that we do not what? Neglect caring for God's people fall short of God's promises, take this for granted, become stiff-necked. And I think this one is a little bit difficult because that verse refers to falling short. Some of these others might be true, but that verse says that you do not want to fall short. Unlike the nation of Israel, we want to enter the promised land. Hebrews 4.3 says that God's work has been finished since when? And you might remember in chapter 4 how we're talking about God's rest. We're, God, he makes this parallel that God has been resting and we want to enter into God's rest where we can rest with God. When did his rest begin? The creation of the world, the resurrection of Christ. God is still working. God works will not be finished until the last day. Hebrews says that the creation of the world, on the seventh day, God rested. And he has been resting. Not that God isn't active, but God is no longer creating. And so we're going to enter God's rest when we enter heaven. For the word of God is alive and active, is able to divide soul and spirit and sharper than any. And I, I really like some of these answers because, uh, Kim, you made these questions, right? And so... And I like how she gave, she gives you freebies every now and then, right? Pruning shears, Jedi lightsaber. I like, I really like that. It, it, when we were taking the Bible, well, it just get, it, 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 these kids can get real frustrated and anxious and tense, and it gives a little bit of a levity and like, oh, it kind of relaxes you a little bit. 
The answer is a double-edged sword because it hurts not only going but coming back and forth, right? It hurts on both sides. It, it, it not only pierces the people you speak to, but it pierces your own heart. Double-edged sword. Since we have Jesus as a great high priest in heaven, what should we hold firmly to? Our living hope, our anchor behind the veil, the faith we profess, the promises of God. And I think this one is C. It's C. We have to hold on to our faith. Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet he was different in which way, right? It was impossible for him to sin. He was God in the flesh and cannot be truly tempted. He knew every word that came from the mouth of God, and he did not sin. Well, C is true. But verse chapter 4, verse 15, what's the point he's trying to make? He's been tempted in every way, but he did not sin. Number D. You guys doing well so far? I mean, when, when I throw these up, are you guys like, oh, yeah, I know the answer. Some of these can get a little hard, right? These are tough. Some of these are tough. And, and so and those kids that were able to answer all of them so well, I was really impressed. It's, I mean, it's impressive. If those kids can do it, we can do it. I'll tell you that. We should approach God's throne of grace with God's throne of grace with confidence, so that may we may receive blank and find blank to help us in our time of need, so that we may receive joy and find peace, receive mercy and find grace, receive hope and re and find confidence, receive rewards and find truth. The answer here is mercy and grace so that we may receive God's mercy and find grace in our time of need. We come boldly to God's throne because, he, again, the point of Hebrews is saying, everything has been established so that you can come right before God, whereas in the Old Covenant you couldn't do that, but you can come right to God when you need Him. Which of the following is not mentioned by Hebrews regarding every high priest? They're selected from among the people. They're descendants of David. They are appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. They offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And this one should be a little bit more obvious. The priests were not just descendants of David. They were descendants of Aaron. Right. So B. What does the, who does the old covenant high priest have to offer sacrifices for besides the sins of the people? So the high priest has to offer sacrifices for sins of the people, but also someone else. The sins of God-fearing Gentiles, the sins of all the ancestors from the time of Moses to the present, the sins of those yet unborn, generations to come, or the sins of the high priest himself. It's D. And so you can remember how, you know, the book of Hebrews is comparing Jesus and the high priest, right? How Jesus is better than the high priest. The high priest foreshadowed Jesus, but the high priest was just a normal man. He, he was sinful like the rest of us. And so whenever he had to sacrifice sins for the whole country, before he could do that, he had to act, sacrifice the sins for himself. Jesus, did he need to sacrifice sins for himself? No, because he had no sins. And that's why Jesus is so much superior. Number 25, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. God said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten, I have become your father. You are a priest in the order of Aaron and Levi. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, Melchizedek, water buffaloes. <laughs> so, I mean, you might remember, you know, in Hebrews, it starts getting into that weird, complicated, whole Melchizedek thing. Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. However, Melchizedek is a priest. Jesus is a priest that way. So the answer is C, Melchizedek. Which of the following was not something that happened during the days of Jesus' life on earth, according to Hebrews 5? Jesus offered up atonement for himself. Well, that didn't happen, right? Jesus offered up prayers and petition. Jesus' prayers were heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus offered up fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Right? And so Hebrews 5 is making the point that, you know, Jesus, he was sinless, but also he was incredibly obedient to God. He, was, he, he prayed to God, and he submitted to God, and he's, they're trying to bring this point that Jesus reached the pinnacle of faith by being sinless and completely obedient. And of course, if he's sinless, he doesn't need atonement. So the answer is A, he doesn't need atonement. 
What is the reason it is hard for the Hebrews writer to make things clear to his reader? So we're starting to talk about to his readers. He's saying, I'm having trouble making this clear to you because they no longer try to understand. They need someone to teach them the elementary truths of God's word all over again. They need milk and not solid food or D, all of these. The answer is D, all of these. They were being stubborn. They weren't listening. And the book of Hebrews says, you should be smarter than this, or you should know more than this. At this point, your maturity should be greater, but instead you're doubting. Instead, you're having trouble, and I'm having to teach you all these elementary things again when I should be able to move to more complex things. And so he's kind of giving them a little bit of a soft rebuke and trying to say, listen, you're not where you are. You need to be growing. And it's partly because you're not listening. It's partly because you're doubting the things that you already taught. It's partly because you need simple things and not difficult things. Instead of milk, solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to blank. Know their right hand from their left hand. Distinguish good from evil. Live in harmony with those who live on milk. Put the needs of others before their own. So he's making that comparison how milk is, is food for children and babies, right? Uh, solid food is food for adults. And so whenever you have that solid food, you're an adult. And that means you're able to what? And the answer here is distinguish good from evil. B. What is not included among some of the elementary teachings that Hebrews 6 lists? And so he gives a list. He's like, I sh you should know all these simple things, but I'm having to reteach you all these simple things. And part in the list, it does not include eternal judgment, angels and demons, resurrection of the dead, faith in God. And one of the elementary things that he s does not include is angels and demons. Falling away from the faith is like doing what? according to Hebrews 6. Spitting in the face of God, throwing yourself headfirst into hell, murdering the Lord's disciples, crucifying the Son of God all over again. The answer is D. Remember, there's this difficult passage where he's saying, listen, if you abandon, there's no sacrifice for sin anywhere else. You're not going to receive forgiveness of sins anywhere else. If you are a Christian and you left, it's like you're putting Jesus on the cross all over again. And so that's the first round. We're going to keep going. Any thoughts or questions at this point? I mean, we really need to appreciate how our kids had to sit down and try to memorize these answers. These are difficult questions, aren't they? And again, I want to stress the point. If the kids can do it, so can we, right? right? When they take the question in the negative, mm -hmm. I think those are the toughest. Yeah. When they say, not this, or yeah. Walt said whenever it's stated in the negative, it's really tough. And I would agree, they really throw me off. Yeah, what I end up doing is choosing the one that does instead of the one that doesn't. And yeah. You've got to be careful when you don't do that. Yeah, it's challenging. It's making sure you're paying attention. Okay. God will not forget our work and the love that we show him in which way? By making burnt offerings, by being a good citizen, by helping and continuing to help his people, by ceasing from our unproductive activities. So God says he's not going to forget our work and our love when we blank. And it is helping and continuing to help his people. It, uh, Hebrews likes to focus on helping one another. I think in Hebrews, whenever he talks about ethical things and trying to say, here's the application, a lot of his application is either looking to Jesus or helping and focusing on one another, right? I think that Hebrews likes to have that theme in there. Hebrews 6.18 says it's impossible for God to do what? I mean, and there's really only one thing that I think God's scripture actually says God cannot do this. It is impossible for God to do this. Give up, grieve, lie, nothing. And the answer is lie. God cannot lie. And that's a really good thing. Hebrews 6 ends by stating that Jesus is our blank who has become a high priest forever in the order of blank. So if you remember the order of Jesus' priesthood, you got this answer, right? Forerunner, Melchizedek. Jesus is our salvation in the order of Aaron. Our anchor in the order of Zedekiah. Our king in the order of David. The answer is A. Again, that, that weird, complicated type of priesthood, Melchizedek. Which of the following does not apply to Melchizedek, right? Does not apply. 
Melchizedek was king of Salem, king of peace, king of righteousness, a Levitical priest. Remember, Melchizedek's priesthood was different than the Levites. So deep. Melchizedek was without each of the following except what? Genealogy, children, father or mother, beginning of days or end of life, right? And for me, I, I had to think twice about this one. The answer was B. It, whenever talking about genealogy, in the book of Hebrews was trying to make this point, saying, you know, Melchizedek, he was a priest, but it, he wasn't a priest because he inherited it from his parents, right? It wasn't about genealogy, right? It wasn't about who his father was or his mother was. And, and his priesthood didn't really have much of an end or, or a beginning because you didn't even read about what happened. And so with Jesus, he's very similar to that in that Jesus wasn't a priest because of who his dad was. Wasn't a priest because he was a descendant of Aaron. He was a priest by a virtue of his incredible life, right? And so you're comparing that to Melchizedek. If a priesthood is changed from the order of Aaron to that of Melchizedek, what also must be changed? The wand, the law, the tent, the sacrifices. The answer is the law. Right. If Jesus is our high priest, and yet in the Old Covenant, the high priests were all Levites, and Jesus is not Levite, then he must be a high priest in a different set of laws. So the law had to be changed. Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah and became a priest with, that, with an oath from the Lord that the other priests did not have. What was that oath? And we're referring specifically to these verses, right? Hebrews 7, 14, 20 to 22. You are a priest forever. He will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You, have, you will have good fortune. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the answer here is you are a priest forever. When Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, he did so, blank, conditionally, only for the Israelites, once and for all, and for himself. The answer is he did it once and for all. And that's one of the big points in the book of Hebrews. You know, those priests, they came and they brought a sacrifice, and then the next day, what'd they do? They came and brought another sacrifice. They brought another and another and another and another, right? And the idea is, if you're having to offer all these sacrifices constantly over and over and over, they must really not be doing anything. But Jesus, he only had to die once, and that one sacrifice was enough for everything, all the sins of all time. And so Jesus' sacrifice is so much more superior. Jesus, our high priest, serves in the sanctuary, the true, naber, true tabernacle set up by blank. You guys remember, what is the new covenant tabernacle? The old, the old covenant tabernacle is the temple, right? The new covenant tabernacle is, you guys remember? Heaven. The temple was shadowed after the pattern in heaven. And so if you know that, then you're asking the question, okay, who set up the tabernacle in heaven? Who set up heaven? David and his offspring, the angels of God, the Lord, the finger, the finger of God. So it had to be the Lord, right? And so who set up heaven? God. How is the Jewish temple or tabernacle compared to the one that is pictured in heaven according to Hebrews 8, right? So the comparison, the, the tabernacle, the temple was ordered in such a way, the blueprint, the architecture was made in such a way to match the, the blueprint of heaven, right? And so in what way were they similar? It is an exact likeness. It's a copy and a shadow. It's the radiance and imprint. It is smaller than the temple above. One of the Hebrews' favorite terms, and the idea is a copy in a shadow, right? Uh, that here's the real thing, and here's the shadow. The shadow kind of looks like it, but it's lacking a lot of substance. The real thing is so much better than just the shadow. How is Jesus' ministry as a priest in the New Covenant described when compared to the priests in the Old Covenant given to Moses? It is superior, it is similar, but heavenly, it is complementary, it is of equal value. This one made me think twice. The answer was, it is superior. Because the answer, it is similar, but heavenly, it could also be true, right? Complementary, I don't think that one's true. Equal value, definitely not. But you have to think, what does that verse say? And if you really don't remember what that verse says, then you're kind of guessing a little bit, aren't you? 
Which of the following is not said about the new covenant in Hebrews 8, 6? It is superior of the old covenant to the old covenant. It is the, not the final revelation of God. It is mediated by Jesus. It is established on better promises. Again, the answer, the question is, what is not said? So which of these was not said in chapter 8, verse 6? The answer was B. It is not said that it is not the final revelation of God. So when God tells Jeremiah that he'll give his people a new covenant, as quoted in Hebrews 8, where does God say he'll put his laws? This one is, I think, a little bit easier. In the minds and hearts, hands and foreheads, doorposts, tablets of stone, the new covenant is put on the hands and the, or the minds and the hearts, right? Since the covenant mediated by Jesus is new, what does this make the old covenant? Chapter 8, verse 13, very important verse. The old covenant is harmful, sinful, boring, obsolete. The answer is obsolete. And so how people think that we're still under the old covenant is beyond me. The first covenant's earthly sanctuary, tabernacle, had a room, and so we're talking about the temple, that first section. And so it had a room with a lampstand, a table, and consecrated bread. It's known as inner courtyard, holy place, chamber of secrets, most holy place. There's a holy place and a most holy place. That first one is the holy place. Which of the following is not one of the gold, golden items associated with the most holy place of the tabernacle? So in, remember in the Ark of the Covenant, what is not in the Ark of the Covenant? The jar of manna, golden breastplate of David, gold-covered Ark of the Covenant, golden altar. The answer is the breastplate of David. That is not in the most holy place. What was said about the tabernacle that Christ, the high priest, went through. Christ went through the tabernacle. What was said about it? It was a greater and more perfect tabernacle. It was not made with human hands. It is not part of this creation. All of these are true. Remember, the tabernacle that Jesus focused on, the tabernacle of our new covenant, is heaven. And so if you can think, okay, heaven was definitely not made with hands. Is heaven part of this creation? I, I don't think that's true. It's not part of this creation. And it is greater and more perfect. The answer, I think, is D. Yeah, the answer is D. The law of Moses required nearly everything to be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is blank. No point in keeping the law, no reason to kill animals except for God, for food, no forgiveness, only false religion. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. God said that in order for people to be forgiven, blood has to be shed. Something has to take the place. Someone has to die. And he, by his mercy, he allows substitutes that Jesus would die in our place. According to Hebrews 9, Christ will appear a second time too. When Christ returns, what's he going to do? Bear sin once and for all? He did that the first time. Offer himself to take away the sins of the many? He did that the first time. Bring the world to final judgment. Bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Again, again, the C could work, but that verse specifically is talking about D, bringing salvation to those who are waiting for him. What does Hebrews 10.1 say about the law and the good things that are coming? The law speaks clearly of the good things. The law can no longer hold back these good things. The law is a shadow of the good things coming. The law is a foretaste of the good things. Remember, Hebrews loves that term, shadow. So here he's saying the law is a shadow of what's going to come. According to Hebrews 10, what has the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all made us? Now, I, I got this one wrong. I remember, I got this one wrong. Because in my translation, the word is sanctified. But there are some passages in Hebrews that say makes us perfect. And sometimes the word perfect can be translated as whole. And so I put whole, but the answer is holy. It does not make us happy. It makes us holy. And so it, it sanctifies us, right? It makes us pure. It makes us set apart and consecrated. The answer is B. The same sacrifices that the priests offer day after day, again after and again, can never do what? Bring them to Roman rule over Judea, end our suffering, bring people to Christ, take away sins. The answer is D. The sacrifices that were done day after day after day. When the priest came in, they brought a sacrifice. The next day, they brought another one and another one and another one. It gives you the idea that those sacrifices really were not that effective. They cannot take away sins. 
After Jesus, our high priest, offered one sacrifice for all time, he sat down at the right hand of God and has been waiting since that time for what to occur? God is, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father waiting for what? For 144,000 Israelites to believe in him, to reign for 1,000 years on earth, for the Antichrist to be revealed, for his enemies to be made his footstool. D. That is the answer put there. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, we profess, for he who promised is a faithful, powerful, gracious, lonely. Hebrews likes to hit on the idea that God is faithful, that he gives you what you promise, that it's not as if you're going to go through all this difficulty, you're going to get to heaven, and God's like, yeah, I told you I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to do that. That's not going to happen. God cannot lie. He is faithful. What's left for those who keep on sinning after having received the knowledge of the truth? True repentance, life sentence in Azkaban, a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire, excommunication from the fellowship into the hands of Satan. Uh, the end of chapter 10 talks about a fearful expectation of judgment. That's what you expect when you leave the faith. What time is it? Um... Kevin, do you remember how long that video is? Yeah, we, we let's just go ahead and pull up that video. Uh, how would you guys do so far? <laughs> fair, fair. I mean, it's a nice. I think it's important reminder to be like, oh yeah, I need to study the Book of Hebrews again. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things that are right that are not the right answer. Right, yeah. And that's the tough part. Oh, yeah. I think Kim did a real good, di real good job of throwing in easy questions and hard questions. It was a great mixture of like, okay, I got this one. And one's like, oh, I don't know if I got that one. It was a really good test. Okay, so, uh, this video is by Bible Project, and it's going to review the book of Hebrews, and it has some incredible artwork that it does. It's going to kind of lay it out. At the end, it's kind of just like one big poster dividing up the book of Hebrews. And I, I love these videos. Uh, for every New Testament book, they have one, and for some more biblical concepts, they have them. The Bible Project is just an absolutely wonderful thing. You can find them on YouTube. Go ahead and play it, Kevin. The letter to the Hebrews. The author of this letter is anonymous, and people have wondered for a long time whether Paul wrote it or maybe one of his co-workers like Barnabas or Apollos, but really we just don't know. In chapter 2 we discover that the author had a first-hand relationship with the disciples who were themselves around Jesus, so we know that this letter is anchored in the teaching of the apostles. We also don't know who the audience of this letter was or even where they lived. The author knows them really well, and he assumes that they have a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, especially the storyline of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, about how Abraham's family became the nation of Israel, about how Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt to Mount Sinai, where they received the Torah and they made a covenant with God, where they built the tabernacle, where the priests offered sacrifices, and also about how they wandered through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. The author just expects that the readers know all of the details about these stories. And so most likely the audience is made up of Jewish Christians that's where the name of the letter comes from. We also have clues from chapter 10 that this church community was facing persecution and even imprisonment because of their association with Jesus. Some in the community were walking away from Jesus and abandoning the faith altogether. And this explains the purpose and the structure of this letter. First, there's a short introduction, which is followed by four sections where the author compares and contrasts Jesus with key people and events from Israel's history. Jesus is first compared with angels in the Torah, second with Moses and the Promised Land, third with priests and Melchizedek, and lastly with the sacrifices and the covenant. And the author has two main goals in all of these contrasts. The first goal is to elevate Jesus as superior to anyone or anything else, showing that Jesus is worthy of all their trust and devotion. But his second goal is this, it's to challenge the readers to remain faithful to Jesus despite persecution. So in every section, he includes a strong warning not to abandon Jesus. So let's dive in now and see how this all unfolds. The elevation of Jesus begins in the opening sentence of the introduction. 
In the past, God spoke to our ancestors in many different ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son. So the author's saying that Jesus is superior to all of the previous ways that God has revealed himself to Israel. He then makes this astounding claim that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's nature. These metaphors are making the closest possible identification between Jesus and God. So Jesus is what the rays of light are to the sun, or Jesus is what the wax impression is to the signet ring. For this author, there is no God apart from Jesus. Jesus is God become human as the sun. And it's this elevated view of Jesus that's then explored throughout the rest of the letter. In the first section, the author compares Jesus with angels, which might strike you as kind of odd, like why angels? In Jewish tradition, it was taught, based on Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, that the Torah and the words of God were delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai by angels. And so by saying that Jesus is superior to angels, the author is claiming that Jesus and his message of good news are superior to all previous messengers of God's word. And so the first warning flows from this very point. If Israel was called to pay attention to the Torah that was delivered by angels, how much more should we pay attention to the message that was announced by the Son of God? And not only that, given Jesus' status high above the angels, how remarkable is it that he gave up that high status to become human, to suffer, and to die? In Jesus, we see God's greatest glory and God's great humility as Jesus sympathetically joined himself to humanity's tragic fate. In chapters 3 and 4, the author moves on to argue that Jesus is superior to Moses, who led the people of Israel through the wilderness and built the tabernacle. Jesus is also the leader of God's people, but in him we see not the builder of just a tent, but of all creation. Then the author retells the story of how the Israelites rebelled against Moses in the wilderness, and they lost their chance to enter into the rest that God offered them in the promised land. And so here comes the second warning. If Jesus is greater than Moses, how much higher are the stakes if we rebel against him? We also are in a wilderness-like environment where we have to trust God for the future rest in God's new creation. So let's make sure that we don't rebel like Israel did in the wilderness and lose out on God's gracious offer to enter his new creation. In chapters 5 through 7, the author then compares Jesus with Israel's priests that come from the line of Aaron. Their role was to represent Israel before God and to offer sacrifices that atoned for or covered over the sins of the people. But, he points out, the priests were themselves morally flawed people, and so they constantly had to offer sacrifices for their own sins as well as for everybody else's. Something more was needed. And so he then argues that Jesus was that something more. He's the ultimate priest. But Jesus did not come from the line of Aaron. Rather, Jesus was a priest in the order of Melchizedek, that mysterious priest king from ancient Jerusalem, and he appears in the stories about Abraham. We also find in Psalm 110 that the messianic king from the line of David will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So the author's whole point is this. Jesus is the ultimate priest king. He's morally flawless. He's eternally available for his people. And so he's superior to any other mediator between God and humans. And thus comes his warning in this section. To reject Jesus is to reject one's best and only chance to be fully reconciled to God. So don't do that which transitions us into the last comparison in chapters 8 through 10. The author shows how Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice, superior to all the animal sacrifices offered in the temple. Those sacrifices had to be offered constantly, both daily but also yearly on the Day of Atonement. Jesus offered his life once and for all, and it was sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. And so the author warns the audience from walking away from Jesus. It's like turning your back on a gracious offer of God's forgiveness. Why would you do that? Jesus' sacrifice is permanent, he says, and it's the foundation for the new covenant spoken of in the prophets, where all sins are forgiven. So now that the author has elevated Jesus through all of these contrasts, 
This final section is one big challenge to follow Jesus. So think big picture. In Jesus, they have found God's very word. In Jesus, they have hope for the new creation. Jesus is their eternal priest. He's the perfect sacrifice. And so now they should follow all the great models of faith found throughout the story of the scriptures, and they should remain faithful to Jesus, trusting that despite whatever hardship and persecution, God will not abandon his people. That's the basic flow of thought throughout the letter, which the author calls right here at the very end, a brief word of exhortation. Here's a couple of extra tips for reading this letter. Whenever the author quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, which is like every other sentence, stop and go look up the reference and read that quotation in its original context. And sometimes you'll be puzzled, but more often you'll see all kinds of extra cool connections that you would never notice otherwise. It's totally worth the effort. You should also just know that these warning passages they're going to make you uncomfortable, and that's kind of the point. They're not there to make you afraid. They're there to show you that rejecting Jesus is foolish because he's so awesome. These warnings all serve the larger purpose of the letter, to show that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God's love and mercy. And that's what the letter of the Hebrews is all about.